Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Weaver here in the Blue and Yellow Kitchen with my guest today, Vivian Gibson, who has come to us from St. Louis, Missouri. Hello, Vivian. Hello, <laughs> I'm so happy to be here or there. Yeah, you're, you're both, it's, it's through the miracle of technology, you're in two places <laughs> at once, so there we go. So I'm yeah. here, we're here with uh, Microwave Boys running the camera and Daisy the Golden Retriever is uh, chasing a toy in the other room. I'm sure she'll be in in a moment to see what we're doing. And we're making, what are we making today, Vivian? We're making uh, skillet cornbread. I'm so excited about skillet cornbread. And so we're featuring Vivian's beautiful book, The Last Children of Mill Creek. Uh, which is a family memoir that I found to be just lovely and I'm so glad you're here today to share your recipe actually it's your older sister Laverne's recipe correct that's correct okay and so I'm going to show the photo so we've got um, you come from a very big family do you not yes uh, eight children <laughs> Eight children, and you are second to last, right? You're number seven. I'm second. I'm second to last, okay. and I, I'm uh, remembering all the stories of my childhood. And my older siblings are, are amazed that I remember everything. <laughs> and this is um, pointing to in the picture of the pointing to Laverne, who's who taught you how to make the cornbread, right? Right. Yeah. She's the older, taller one, yes. I guess. Yeah, very, uh, all very beautiful. Um, so we're going to talk about your family and your upbringing and the neighborhood in St. Louis where you grew up. But I want to get the cornbread started because it has to hydrate for about 10 minutes. So uh, okay. we've got, I've got the, um, so that we'll be sharing the recipe in the comments. So you don't have to write anything down, folks. But I've got cornmeal, all-purpose flour, which in my version is gluten-free, a little bit of sugar, baking powder and salt are already all mixed together in this pan or this bowl. And then I've got two eggs that I'm just going to break in this bowl right next to your face. So, <laughs> um, which is probably a little bit odd. Probably nobody's ever done that before to you. Um, and I'm just going to use a, a little, you know, fork to mix those together. And then the only other ingredient, there's two other ingredients. So normally you use butter, correct? With this? Well, lately I use butter, but that's not how, how I learned. How did you learn? I learned with bacon grease. Okay, so I have bacon to... bacon drippings. They were always available. Ooh. <laughs> they were <laughs> they were always available, sitting right on the kitchen counter, and uh, that's what we used. So uh, my great boy has labeled our bacon drippings. Oink, in case you couldn't read that, folks. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so we're doing a quarter cup of that, and then you have to add a little bit more buttermilk if you're using the gluten-free flour. So I've, okay. I'll note that in the recipe just to, make, <clears throat> to get it the right uh, kind of liquidity here. But I'm going to put everything together, mix it, and then it sits for 10 minutes. So tell us why it sits for 10 minutes, because I thought that was... That was something I didn't actually know about cornbread. Yeah, I think that really does add to the moisture of, uh, of the finished product. It, uh, it absorbs the, the dry flour and cornmeal and just softens it and hydrates it a little bit. Yep. I think it really does uh, benefit it in the, in the end. Great. Okay, so I'm mixing this together and then I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes while we chat. So the okay. oven is preheated, and you want to put your uh, cast iron skillet in the oven while it's the oven's preheating, because you want that skillet to be really hot, so you get yeah. this beautiful crust on it. Um, yeah, that's that's the, the best part for me. It is the best part, and this. Well, after, after eating it, of course. Yes, after. <laughs> well, and the, <laughs> and the thing is that you know I've I've made it in a skillet before, but I had never done the bacon drippings and I made a test batch a couple days ago and it was incredible and I was like oh where has this been all my life so <laughs> thank you for introducing me to that because that was we were pretty excited about that all right yeah so. I'm a little bit of, uh, sort of ashamed because I grew up that way and I know how good it is but somehow as I got older I thought oh it shouldn't be bacon it should be butter and uh, so I kind of straight away from it but every once in a while I go back to the bacon and I go oh my goodness yeah. this is so good it's really good now if you want and it, it but it is very savory so if you're wanting the cornbread where you're going to put maybe butter and jam on it Maybe you yeah. would want to use butter, but if you wanted the savory application of the cornbread, yeah. it's quite good. And that's, 
And that's how I usually use cornbread with, you know, as a savory with, with dinner um, and that sort of thing. But you're absolutely right. If, if you want to have it for uh, with tea or coffee or for, for uh, breakfast even, uh, you can use honey or uh, put a little, even put a tiny, tiny bit more sugar in it and uh, it's just as good. Yeah, so it's, I'm really gonna encourage you guys to try the recipe because it is fantastic and you can make it gluten-free or not gluten-free. So, and of course if you're um, vegetarian, you would use butter, but um, <laughs> not the bacon drippings. Um, but we happen to have like really high quality, I don't make it very often, but we use high quality bacon and so we keep it in the fridge and it is a really nice little luxury. So, okay, so let's get to, to your book. While the, while the batter or the dough is hy hydrating up, um, tell us where Mill Creek was because Mill Creek no longer exists, is that correct? Absolutely, it does not exist anymore. Mill Creek was a community in downtown St. Louis, um, the older part of the city as a matter of fact. And uh, it was where the city began and started uh, growing west and east and south and all the um, uh, inhabitants, all the immigrants who came to St. Louis over a hundred, couple of hundred years all lived in this area but then they moved out. And around the turn of the century, 19. 1920, um, blacks started migrating from the south, and they too lived in these, these homes that were available. Uh, by that time, they were pretty old, and the neighborhood was pretty run down, um, and it became a segregated community in St. Louis, and blacks were, were uh, not allowed to live many other places except this community, so it was tight-knit. Um, were poor, many of them um, came from rural areas uh, in Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, um, escaping um, all the cruelties and racism of the South. They, they came to St. Louis and um, that was where I was born. That's where my family came. And uh, so I write about my childhood in this enclave and uh, what it was like uh, to be a child. And it's called The Last Children of Mill Creek because we were in fact the last generation of children to live there before the community was demolished. Right, so this is one of those examples of um, you know, urban renewal or yes. you know, rebuilding that you know, they we're putting a highway through, I believe, and so the people, and actually your grandmother owned the home that you lived in, Is that's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. She, and uh, she owned it only maybe five years before the community was demolished. She, she had no idea that the city and um, the government had, had been talking about demolishing this neighborhood for 30 years, and I think maybe it, uh, she wasn't uh, convinced that it was ever going to happen. Right. So, uh, although she was a domestic worker on a, on a very low salary, she was able to save enough money for a down payment on this house. And we were one of only a few uh, black families who actually did own their homes. Most of them were rentals uh, with slum lords and, and that sort of thing. But we did own our house. Yeah, as modest as it was. Right, and there's a lot of pride in that, and there, and also, you know, a lot of black families were not able to get loans, were not able to buy homes at all. So the fact that exactly. you were home, she was a homeowner, and you lived in her home, is a real testament to um, to to them being able to do that at that time. It's still an issue, as, as we know, for black families to get loans, and you know, all, all yes. of that is, is not over for sure. Um, for sure. Yeah. So, so one of the things that so it's a you have eight kids, two parents. Grandma lives on the top floor. You guys yes. are all sharing. Were all the kids in one room, or were there two rooms that the kids were in? Well, actually, it was basically one room okay. and then a, 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 an area of the basement. Okay, because you had bunk yes. beds, so you were all kind of really right on top of each other, and I. 
I felt like as I was reading the book, I, I felt like I was there. Like I really felt like I had the experience of being with you and your family and seeing it from your child's perspective because you you know, when we're kids we don't make judgments about it's just how things are. And so yeah. it was very um, you know, you have all these wonderful stories that you remember about your different siblings. Um, tell us about your mom and her bed because I just found that whole sequence. Your mother sounded amazing, and I'm sorry that you lost her relatively young in, in her life and your life. Um, but tell yes. us about her bed because that whole scene, she's such a vivid character, and um, I really love, I would love for the audience to hear about your mom. Well, I, I think it's very obvious that. It in the book that I loved my mother yes. uh, and she was a fascinating person she uh, did not work outside the home which was rather unusual for black women at that time uh, she worked from home she was an artist and a crafts person so she made things with her hands and I she crocheted she quilted she sewed she she made flowers on, on Mother's Day. She crafted these beautiful flowers that we went out as children and sold to people going to church on Mother's Day. Uh, she, oh God, and she, all of this was basically self-taught. She was just a very creative person. And she, because we had so little room, we probably lived in about 800 square feet. Uh, ten of us, eight children and, and my parents. And so the only workspace she had was her bed. We didn't really have tables and chairs. We had beds and chiffre robes, we called them, the places where we hung our clothes and, and drawers. And so she worked from her bed. And when my father uh, went to work in the morning, she spread the uh, covers over and then put down what she called a drop cloth, which is basically uh, a, a large piece of uh, muslin. And um, she kept all of her work materials in this large boxy suitcase that she kept under her bed. So she pulled out this suitcase and it had all of her thread and needles and scissors and patterns and all, all kinds of things in it and she worked from that bed. Yeah, it's it's such a to me it's such a testament to her industriousness and making do with what you have, and and then she was in this situation was creating all this beauty and I love that she made hats and she sold hats to the women of the church and there was a scene where you all ended up having to go to a funeral I feel like and then you all wore the hats and then knew that you, she was going to have to make more. Can you remind me what that story was? Because I feel like I'm not doing it justice. Well, actually, I grew up watching her make these hats and actually learning to help her finish them. And so that scene that you're describing is actually her funeral. Oh, and okay. um, the hats that we wore, I made. Okay. And uh, at that time, I was an adult living in New York. I had gone to... Um, Fashion Design School at the Institute of uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, and actually took a millinery class because I knew it was a, a, a real a certain A for me because I probably knew everything they were going to teach because I'd watched my mother do it all of my life, and so in fact I put myself through college making hats like my mother and giving fashion shows. Wow. And so I brought those hats with me and all of my sisters, in honor of my mother, we wore wow. these beautiful hats that that's, I made. That's fabulous. Well, thank you for reminding me the full, the full circle-ness of that story because your mom yes. really was such an inspiration. And um, so the, uh, I'm, the Dough is ready, or the batter is ready to go in the pan. So before we go on to another part of your book, let me grab um, my preheated. So you got to use your uh, hot pads, everybody. Yeah. Very easy hopefully, hopefully they can really hear and see the sizzle. Yeah. Well, you're going to hear it because it's going to be right by your head again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we do some more of the bacon or butter into the pan, and. 
You cannot forget the pan is incredibly hot, so you've got to make yeah. sure when you pick it up. And I like this lodge because it's uh, got a handle on each side, kind of, so it's much easier to handle when it's really, really hot. So what I'm doing is I'm rolling the, um, the fat or the oil around to, to coat everything evenly. And now the, the batter is going to go in, and hopefully we will get that sizzle. Right. I hear sizzling. Yes. Yeah. That's the sound. That's the sound. And you don't really need to do anything to the top. You just kind of, I think, just push it in. It's, it is for sure sizzling around the edges, and then it's going right, right. in the oven. And so those edges are going to rise faster than the center, and you'll have what almost looks like crust on the on the out on the outer perimeters of it. Fantastic. Okay, so um, so Vivian's recipe, you're doing a 10-inch skillet. I have a 12-inch skillet, so you do need to adjust the time. So if your skillet is bigger or smaller, you're going to need to check it. So I'm setting mine for 30 minutes because I figured out that was probably about right the last time. So that's why I always yeah. do the recipes once before we do the show. What was the time? If your skillet your skill is two inches bigger, of course, you're going to have a thinner cornbread. Right, right. So it's going to be a little thinner. Um, but yeah, so you call for 40 minutes with the, with the size of the skillet that you call for, that you use. So, um, and and, and that's, a, that's a good guess. You really do need to touch the center of the, the cornbread with, with, with your full two, three or four fingers slap. And if, that, if that's firm, it's ready. So Great. that's always a little bit of a guess depending on, on your stove and that sort right. of thing. Yeah, and I like to, so I always preheat my oven for 20 solid minutes because I've learned, I, I have a, um, a little oven thermometer that sits in there. And I've learned that when it tells me it's ready, it's actually not to temperature. So I always do yeah. that. And that's when you can throw the, you know, put the skillet in there to make sure it's nice and hot. So let's yeah. talk a little bit more about your book. And then we will take a, um, a recording break. It won't seem like it on the video through the magic of video, but we'll come back when the, when the cornbread's finished. So, um, so tell, tell me a little bit about, um, so one of the scenes that I love so much is that, um, you talking about ironing the shirts because my mother was taught to iron shirts by her German grandfather in Queens, New York. And it was a very specific way that she was taught to iron shirts. And it's the yeah. exact way you were taught to iron shirts. And I was like, somebody else learned the same exact method. I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. So I was so related to that. And then, um, but your father who, was, uh, who worked for the um, St. Louis Transit, correct? Was his job? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it so. Was, it was, go ahead. Go on. It was called public service, but it was basically the streetcar and bus company for, for the city. Yeah. And so, and so he was, and your memories of him, he's, a, he's another strong character. Although I'd say of the two of them, your mother is the more maybe vivid character because your dad maybe wasn't around as much because he was working really hard. And then he yeah. was, he was pretty badly injured, uh, by, was he hit by a trolley? Is that what happened? No, he was working repairing the streetcar tracks, and a truck hit him, uh, just drive driving along, and it was a, a hit and run. He hit oh. him and kept going, and so my father was uh, very badly injured, and uh, the hospitals in St. Louis were segregated at that time, and so he. As, as it was an emergency and he was very injured, they first took him to the White Hospital, but that was just to stabilize him so that they could then send him to what was called the Colored Hospital. Yeah. And so he spent that time there and the Colored Hospital, which is called People's Hospital, was not was walking distance from our house. So we, um, we often walked up on Sunday afternoons at after church and stood outside and, and yelled and waved at him. 
<laughs> and he was he because he his leg was very badly injured, right? So they kind of had to reconstruct his leg and yeah. And like, then given the time, I guess you just stayed in the hospital a lot longer yeah. these days. They get no matter what's wrong with you, you're out. Right, you're out in a, a day at the but most. He was in the hospital a pretty a, 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 a long time. Yeah, and one of the things that I. Uh, that I was sort of attracted to about the point of view of the child, because you, you know everything's told from your child's point of view, right? So it's the way right. you see your house. And, and in some cases, very very early, some of the right in the earlier part of the book, I feel like I'm only about four years old because I can remember when my older siblings went off to school and how the atmosphere of our home changed when there were just two little children and my mother around. So I imagine that some of these memories are as early as four years old. Wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah, so one of the things that, you know, so seeing it all from your child's perspective, I really appreciated that. And um, one of the things that would happen when you would visit your father in the hospital is that he would save his sugar packets for you. And it yes. wasn't something you guys really had. So that for you was like this big treat. And I just thought that was such a pointed child's perspective. It's like, you're not necessarily thinking about, oh my gosh, is dad okay? And all this terrible things happen to our family. You're like, ooh, I get, I get sugar because he's in this cool <laughs> place. And I just, you know, and I like that you didn't as an adult feel like you needed to editorialize that. You just kind of, that's just how you saw it, and it was a special yes. treat that you got. And you would be not, you were kind of naughty, and you would take extra packets, right? And just kind of be yeah. eating, eating those on your own. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what I wanted, how much I want to say while we're doing a cooking show about what happened when I ate way too much sugar. <laughs> but you can imagine, but I would um, be one of the. My mother would bring home every week. Uh, he would uh, collect all the sugar and the tissue and the lotion and things like that and send them home to us once a week. And we were so excited to get this packet from from, from Daddy. Yeah. And um, my favorite part was these little individual packs of sugar. And my mother would sometimes just uh, kind of dole them out like little gifts, you know, for us to put on oatmeal or sometimes we butter toast and sprinkle the sugar over them. But I uh, kind of uh, pilfered a few of them uh, on my own. And uh, one night I took a, a pretty big handful of the sugar and in the dark in my bed just, just pile the sugar <laughs> on my tongue and savored it all night and it really did upset my stomach. <laughs> and it's such a kid thing to do. So that's what I yes. really loved. It's so <laughs> completely relatable. And I, you know, I, I yeah. do. Yeah. When I was writing the book, my sister, who's about five years older than me, which means she's about 75 or six, said, are you going to write about what you did in my bed after <laughs> eating that sugar? I went, oh, yes. Oh, that's so I great. had to. Yeah. <laughs> she insisted that I yeah. write that story. There you go. Um, so a couple other characters that I really enjoyed was you got to go visit Aunt Mary. So tell us about yeah. Aunt Mary, because there were some kind of memorable meals at her house as well. Yeah. My mother had this um, knack for finding friends who uh, had no children. And uh, they all ended up being our godmothers. And Aunt Mary was mine. Um, and she had no children, and she had this pristine home that was the opposite of ours. Ours was crowded and junky and, and just, you know, not just what we had to do. Hers was beautiful. She had furniture and rugs and polished dressers and, and uh, a beautiful kitchen with with every utensil she might nest or tool she needed in the kitchen and she was a domestic worker as well and she was she cooked so she cooked for rich people so her cooking was totally different from, from what how we cooked and so i loved going there because it was just a fantasy for me and i i really do believe that i got a lot of my aesthetics 
pictures and my love for cooking uh, and, and beautiful things from her. And uh, she made pound cakes and, and uh, pecan pies and, and these wonderful yeast rolls that to this day we simply call Aunt Mary's rolls. And so I, on holidays I still make those rolls and everybody wants to know, are you making Aunt Mary's rolls? <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a wonderful experience for me to go over there and spend Saturday afternoons uh, just being in her space and being a, almost an only child and having that attention and eating these beautiful things and setting the table. You know, we ate, we didn't even have two plates that matched and Aunt Mary had everything that matched and, and, and she taught me to set the table table and, and what fork to use. It was just a wonderful experience for me. Yeah, it sounded amazing. And and I, I could very much see that contrast between your home and sort of getting to have this sort of special treat. Of, but it was also your mother's way of gifting the company of a child to a woman that had no children. So yes. there was, yes. and to also expose us to experiences we she couldn't give us. Yes. Yeah, so there was a lot of really beautiful stuff in there that I appreciate you sharing. So we're going to take a quick video break, and we'll be back when the cornbread is done. See you all. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay, we're back. And the timer's, Vivian's still here in the kitchen. It's like magic. Um, The timer's just about to go off, so I'm actually going to check and see how it looks, and I'm going to show our expert. See if she gives it the um, the digital virtual thumbs up. Um, so she can't actually be here, but it's, I think it's looking pretty good, Vivian. All right. So the top of it is is firm, has some light cracks. Right, okay. cracks are good. And then some nice brown crispy edges. How did I do, ma'am? That looks great. <laughs> okay, yay! That's what I like to hear. When my expert tells me I did great, then I'm happy. All right, so let me set that down, turn the oven off. And Vivian is going to read us a a short passage because about the cornbread while it's cooling enough for me to taste it. So go ahead, let's hear hear it. Well, this passage uh, that you requested from the book happens to be uh, sort of the recipe. And a lot of people have been attracted to this, so it's really funny. So um, I'm going to start in the middle of a passage that really deals with how much I loved cooking and uh, how I had a lot of mishaps, uh, almost burning the house down, almost burning myself a couple of times, just cooking without supervision. So it comes to, uh, uh, then it gets to this portion where I talk about uh, the cornbread. Determined, I learned to cook fluffy rice, cobblers, and flaky flaky pie crust. And I soon perfected the essential cornbread. I knew my cornbread was good when my sister Brenda commanded me without the slightest hint of sisterly praise, make some cornbread for dinner. I jumped at the opportunity. My oldest sister, Laverne, had taught me how to make this golden disc of brown goodness using only sight and my hands for measuring. I learned to confidently combine three heaping handfuls of yellow cornmeal and one heaping handful of flour, half a cup and a cup pound of salt, a full cup pound of sugar, and the same of baking powder, two eggs, and enough buttermilk to thoroughly moisten all the dry ingredients. Laverne was careful to remind me to add the buttermilk in small amounts until the batter was just loose enough to pour, but not runny. She repeated an important rule that Miss Savannah, her godmother, had told her. You can always add more milk, but you can't take it out. I patiently 
We waited for the temperature of the hot iron skillet to transfer to the rendered bacon grease that generously covered the bottom of the blackened pan. Mixing half of the flavorful hot fat into the barely fluid consistency of the mixing bowl, I then quickly poured my concoction into the skillet. The sizzling edges of the cornbread batter that spread along the bottom and up the sides of the heated cast iron formed an immediate perfect crust that filled me with pride. Then I waited as the heat of the oven evaporated the moisture inward and away from the surface of the bread and the crust rose slightly to a crispy ring of crunch Finally, I know it was ready when a shallow crack in the center of the bread formed as the last steam, steaming moisture escaped like a dying volcano. <clears throat> when I placed a wedge of my creation on Daddy's plate and announced, I made the cornbread, mm -hmm. Mama smiled, and Daddy took a, a big bite and proclaimed, My baby show can cook. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. So I, I cut a wedge while you were reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. So we're going to give it a little taste here. So it's definitely got this nice brown, crispy. Wow, um, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. So thank you, Bacon Drippings. <laughs> <laughs> and because your pan was a slightly larger, yours is a little thinner, but some people like a crunchy than a cornbread. Mm -hmm. I should also add that I sometimes now make this cornbread on top of the stove in a cast iron skillet mm -hmm. with an ice cream scoop of, uh, of the batter and uh, make little, little hoe cakes. Oh. Uh -huh. And I freeze them. Ooh. I freeze them and I, I will pull one out months later, nice. wrap it in the microwave for about a minute on 50% power and it, it's perfect. It's back, you have delicious, so that's a couple of wonderful tips, so I wasn't expecting all those bonus tips. Oh, it's, it's very, so it's, what's lovely is it's very moist and you can see the nice crumb. Um, the very the bottom is very crispy. If I left it in a couple more minutes, I think it might have been overdone. So I think I pulled it out at the right time. And as we mentioned, I will know when I post the recipe will be in the comments, and I've got the notations for gluten free. And if your skillet is a different size, Vivian, we want to thank you so much for sharing the last children of Mill Creek with us. I love the book. If you'd like to um, win a copy of the book, just leave a comment here. We'd love it if you'd share the video as well. We look yes. forward to, uh, um, and, and then there'll be a, a link to buy it if you want to encourage you to order it. Support black artists, support black voices. That's part of what we're about here in the Blue and Yellow Kitchen. And Vivian, thank you so much for sharing a bit of your life with us today. We really appreciate it. You well, can... thank you, Stephanie, for the opportunity. Yeah. It's been very difficult to promote a book during a pandemic and, and the racial strike that's going on in our country. So this was a wonderful opportunity for Absolutely. me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So Vivian-Gibson.com is her website. So check that's out right. check out her and The Last Children of Mill Creek. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you again in the Blue and Yellow Kitchen. Bye.